Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping have conducted two days of meetings in Moscow. The two have praised each other and promised to deepen ties. Xi Jinping comes to Moscow with a proposed peace deal between Russia and Ukraine. The United States criticized Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow, saying it was giving cover to Vladimir Putin for war crimes. Meanwhile, Japanese President Fumio Kishida made a surprise visit today to Kiev, which is seen as a sign of support for Ukraine. And Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen also announced that she will be making a trip to the United States in the coming weeks, which predictably provoked an angry response from China. Crazy times that we're living in. Joining me to help unpack all of this is Mel Gertoff. Mel Gertoff is a professor emeritus of political science at Portland State University. He's also senior editor of the quarterly journal Asian Perspective. Formerly, many decades ago, he was part of the RAND Corporation, where he was a co-author of the Pentagon Papers. He was one of the people who worked on the Pentagon Papers that would testify uh, in defense of Daniel Ellsberg's trial in the 1970s. He is also the author of the book, Engaging China. Mel Gertov, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thanks very much, Mitch. Very happy to be with you. I, I, I woke up this morning and, you know, looked at the newspaper just to see what the latest was going to be between the talks of Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping. And then I see right underneath that surprise visit by Jap- the Japanese prime minister to Kiev. Taiwanese president is announced that she will be making a visit to the United States. And my head was spinning and I was just it, it would be hard not to think that th- these are all connected. How do you see this? Well, they are all connected ultimately to uh, to the war and to U.S. China tensions. Uh, Xi Jinping and and Putin uh, have their conference. I think mainly uh, the idea was uh, for uh, Xi Jinping to show China's continued support of the Russian nar- narrative on on the war and why it has occurred and where it needs to go. I don't really expect any significant uh, agreements. I think ma- mainly it's a gift to Putin, although uh, I, I still doubt that it's going to lead as uh, our State Department seems to think to the supply of finished weapons uh, from China to to Russia. Uh, as for um, the visit to to Kiev by the Japanese Foreign Mi- Prime Minister, I think uh, that's a- another sign of how Japan is really stepping up and stepping out in terms of U.S. Um, of support for the U.S. and NATO uh, in the war. So that alignment. Uh, continues uh, China on one side, Japan Japan on the other, um, and I think uh, what what needs to be also added on the Japanese side, and I've written some about this, is that uh, uh, Japan's new um, national security strategy paper indicates very clearly that um, that Japan is moving right uh, in the sense of uh, bolstering its um, its military uh, capability. And finally, doing what the United States has urged for decades, and that is for Japan to become what the U.S. considers a normal nation um, in terms of its uh, of its role in, in East Asia and, for that matter, internationally, um, especially on the military side, actually. And then um, the visit from uh, from China, from uh, Taiwan's president uh, to the U.S., uh, in a way, is a a compensation for the fact that uh, Kevin McCarthy is not going to go to Taiwan and try to repeat the blunder, at least as I see it, the blunder that Nancy Pelosi made in making that trip, So, which was the cause of quite a ratcheting up of U.S.-China tensions. Well, of course, China is, as you said, upset about, as it will always be, about any representative of Taiwan going to the United States. Uh, but the fact is that it's far less attention producing than if uh, if the reverse were true and some major U.S. official were to go to Taiwan. So um, all of these things uh, simply show that um, in every in any number of ways, uh, tensions are running very high. And with that comes always the danger of miscalculations that could lead to an expansion of uh, of the war. I mean, it just seems like a historic moment, even in in, in the ratcheting up of, of tensions at this moment. Well, it could it could well be. Um, mm, you know, yeah. I 
I, we I, have I world think, leaders, you know, on yeah. different sides showing up in other countries' war zones uh, on all sides. It's yes, uh, all that. Um, uh, of course, everybody wants to show uh, support for President Zelensky, and um, you know, and therefore the willingness to you know fly right into a war zone. We we haven't uh, seen that kind of thing in, in previous conflicts, um, but uh, it just. It, it's just another sign of what a dangerous time we're living in. How would you describe the relationship between China and Japan? Well, uh, of course, uh, it's it's always been uh, very tense and uh, rarely uh, anything uh, normal. And right now, I think it's uh, it's it's one of those relationships that's going to be uh, more tense than usual for the reason that I just mentioned. Uh, Japan is is you know firmly under the U.S. Uh, security umbrella, but increasingly is stepping out, as its uh, latest uh, strategy paper shows. And uh, the U.S. is reinforcing its um, its capabilities in Okinawa, uh, as well as in Guam and the Philippines. And so, uh, what we have is um, is a what what could easily be interpreted as a, a revitalization of the whole containment approach to China. And Japan is very much uh, a part of that. Uh, it's no longer holding back. And uh, one question that that therefore lingers in the minds of many is, uh, well, what if there were another crisis over Taiwan, you know, a military crisis, uh, one that involved the use of force? Would Japan assist, directly assist the United States uh, against China? And uh, we don't really know uh, firmly what the answer is. I'm not sure that folks in the Pentagon know the answer for sure. But um, for the first time, I think it's possible to say that uh, Japan might uh, very well be positioning itself to be an active player in that drama. There is a notion that China is paying very close attention to the war in Ukraine. Obviously, it is. It, it, you know, Xi Jinping's in Moscow now with, with a peace plan. But it's also paying very close attention to the war in Ukraine to see what the outcome will be, precisely because it may signal what the United States may do or how far the United States may go in protecting Taiwan if China were, try to, ta were, were to try to take over Taiwan. Do you, do you think that's an accurate assessment? No, actually not. Um, I I think that uh, that connection between what happens in Ukraine and what happens in the Taiwan Strait uh, is um, is one that has been pushed ever since uh, Putin went to uh, Beijing at the time of the Winter Games, uh, and uh, and out of that came the the notion that there were quote no limits to uh, China Russia relations. Well. Uh, there have been, there are limits. Uh, there always have been. I think that that business of uh, emphasizing no limits was a very mistaken me reading of their of that meeting, uh, and and part of that uh, misreading was that uh, uh, China would would very likely take advantage of U the U.S. being bogged down in the war uh, in Ukraine. And, uh, and that China might see this as an opportunity to try to recover Taiwan. Um, I think the two things are very, uh, are very uh, distinctly different. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, all these predictions that have come out of Washington and the war games that have been conducted uh, to deal with the Taiwan situation uh, are simply a, a ratcheting up of war tensions that's, that's not really justified. Xi Jinping is very well aware uh, of how of the U.S. the likely U.S. reaction uh, to a Chinese use of force against Taiwan, and uh, it has uh, nothing really to do with with the war in in Ukraine. There, you know, there the Chinese are very are very conscious, as are we, of how terribly destructive uh, such a war would be, and of course it it, it involves uh, nuclear weapon states. Uh, and, uh, and and no one wants to produce a nuclear uh, confrontation. And moreover, um, I think Xi Jinping has said time and again that um, that while there is a, a Chinese red line, and that red line is that Taiwan should declare independence, beyond that, uh, his the Chinese position remains what it has been for a very long time, which is peaceful reunification. 
Now, that doesn't mean the Chinese are not upset with how, how much military uh, capability the United States has continued to provide Taiwan. And to some extent, it's justified by in terms of Taiwan's defensive capabilities. Uh, but uh, the Chinese are not going to to uh, uh, get into a situation where where there is uh, going to be war over over Taiwan. What is China's and Xi Jinping's interest with Russia and its interest with the war in Ukraine? I think uh, the the Chinese are in a position uh, that is, if not embarrassing, at least um, uh, very un, uh, unfavorable, and um, and and it's a it's a, qu- a case where they're straddling the fence. Uh, trying not to become a party to the war, and yet needing to show Russia that it is a faithful ally. And so it puts forward this uh, peace plan, uh, which has been around in, in one form or another almost since since uh, Putin uh, launched his invasion. And the uh, the evident purpose uh, is to show that, uh, that China uh, accepts Putin's narrative on the war, that it's really was provoked by by NATO, uh, but at the same time, uh, to be very um, uh, uneasy about the fact that that Putin is invading an, an independent country with which China has in the past had a positive relations, and so uh, what China would be, of course, most happy with from the standpoint of its own interests uh, would be if Putin would, could be satisfied with occupying the Donbass region, uh, essentially uh, holding on to Crimea and stopping the war. Uh, and uh, that's a, a selling point, which of course, NATO and the United States uh, uh, have always rejected. Uh, Mr. Zelensky has rejected it. It's really a non-starter. Uh, so all it does is, is uh, for China is to try to portray itself to the world you know, uh, given its its expanding diplomatic uh, interest, trying to show China as uh, as a peacemaker, uh, just as it showed recently with in the Middle East with Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, but knowing full well that uh, this is not a peace plan that's going to get anywhere. It was shocking if you weren't. Following of course, it. I should. Sorry. Please go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to add that on the military side. Uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, the U.S. U.S. officials keep warning China not to provide uh, weapons to uh, to Russia, uh, the Chinese certainly are providing some military material. Uh, you know their hands are not are not clean on on this matter, but uh, it's it's apparent that uh, they're steering clear of becoming a major uh, as they could becoming a major weapon supplier. Uh, I just wish that U.S. diplomacy were were uh, were uh, accomplished with a a much clearer notion of what irks the Chinese and what is most likely to bring about the result that we want. Uh, you don't. It's not a good idea to try to bully the Chinese, and um, and every time they do, which happened very recently when the U.S. tried to warn China uh, uh, very openly, uh, don't supply w- weapons to to Ukraine. The Chinese are going to push back, and it's. And tell the United States, as they did recently, that you know this is none of your business. Um, after all, you are busy supplying uh, your Ukraine uh, allies, and so you know, in theory, we have the right to to make our own choices. That's exactly what they said. Uh, so you don't, you know, the Chinese have a long, long history, as you know, uh, of being bullied by the West. You know, that goes way back into the 19th century, and. Um, and 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 they're using the same language today. So so you want to carry out diplomacy, uh, you know, and, and 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 try to impart the notion that you know we're we're very upset with with the thought that there may be a weapon supply, uh, and it, you want to do that in a different way and behind the scenes. Uh, and it's and it's just the sort of thing that gets the Chinese uh, up up in arms and um, and and upset and you know and and pushes them to try to do exactly the opposite of what you want them to do. This is Letters on Politics, and we are in conversation with Mel Gertov. Mel Gertov is a professor emeritus of political science at Portland State 
University. He's senior editor of the quarterly journal Asian Perspective. He is the author of the book Engaging China. Also, several decades ago, he was with the Rand Corporation, where he was a co-author of the Pentagon Papers. In fact, he was the only one working on the Pentagon Papers who would testify uh, on behalf of Daniel Ellsberg during the trial of Daniel Ellsberg in the 1970s. Mel Gertov, I do want to talk about history with you. That's what we like to do on this radio program. Um, and it's also, it hasn't, it, it's very clear to me and very interesting to me how Russia, China, and the United States, these are the three countries that are probably the three most important countries during the Cold War. But even before the Cold War, you, you mentioned China has a history of being bullied uh, by the West. Tell me, I'll give me a quick outline of, of that history and why, why it still matters. Yes, well, um, you know, for a very, very long time, uh, the Chinese empire, you know, so we're now talking about the period before 1912 and the so-called uh, revolution, uh, that China was really closed down uh, to the West. And it was the British uh, for starters, and then other Western powers uh, who uh, tried to pry China open. Uh, and of course, the opium trade is, is just a part of that very, uh, very long and very, uh, very negative history. And so um, you have you have that period leading up to uh, 1911, 1912, uh, and the, the end of the of the China's dynastic period. And then the the effort to establish uh, concessions in China uh, by the British, uh, the Germans, and others, and eventually uh, by by Japan as well. And so, uh, it, it, as the Chinese like uh, put it, and many Western historians put it, China was essentially carved up. And so, all that history, uh, which amounts to what the Chinese call a, a century of humiliation, uh, remains very much a part of China's historical view. Uh, we see it uh, may, uh, put forward time and again in, when the Chinese are talking about uh, very, very contemporary uh, issues. And, uh, and we have to be uh, very sensitive uh, to that because it's, it's a deeply held uh, belief that, uh, that the Western powers, and of course at one time that included Russia too, uh, in, in China's north, uh, northern area. And so the, the Ch and, and that's, I think, part of China's memory too, you know, which, which is a, 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 a period, something that is, um, I think, a, an obstacle even today in China-Russia uh, relations. So um, there, is, there is that, uh, that view that, uh, that the West is, um, is, is dangerous, that it has, um, that it has always been um, at China's doorstep and uh, has treated China unequally. And I think uh, what this leads to today is um, in a period when China now uh, has risen, we can't even say it's rising, it's already risen, it's become uh, one of the great uh, powers, especially economically in the world, uh, is that China is now demanding a, a, an equal place at the table on all international issues. That's, that's, I think, the, the fundamental thing that's going on here. And one can't understand how strong that view is without taking into account where China was historically as, the, uh, as it was put once upon a time, the weak man of Asia. Well, it's no longer the weak man of Asia. It's now a great power. And, uh, and it's exerting that power in a number of ways, including through diplomacy, uh, whether it's in the Ukraine war or now in the Middle East, uh, the Chinese are now everywhere, as great powers typically are. I suspect it's important to always keep in mind that <clears throat> both China and Russia have U.S. military bases around, all, all around it, whereas you don't have that the other way around. We don't have Chinese or Russian bases near us. Right. Uh, the Chinese only have one one base at the moment uh, in Africa, in Djibouti. But and, and but, you know, uh, great powers um, act in very similar ways there. I think we have to expect that at some time in the near future, uh, the Chinese will have other bases. Uh, they may not be uh, 
permanent bases of the sort that the United States has had for a very long time, especially in uh, in East Asia, uh, all now very much uh, being built up to to try to contain China. Uh, the Chinese may may be more interested in access military access points with their naval forces in particular. Uh, but uh, you know, great powers are going to establish a presence of one kind or another everywhere, including in America's backyard uh, in Latin America. Uh, so these, and yet every time uh, that happens. Uh, with China, uh, the United States is up in arms as though somehow only we have a right to establish uh, military presence around the world. And of course, uh, no no other power, whether it's Russia, China, or any other, uh, has anything approaching the the uh, number of U.S. military bases and access points that we have uh, globally. The the. You, you referred to this. The relationship between China and Russia is also complicated through history. Is is what sort of puts Russia and China makes them somewhat allies? Is this tension that both countries have with the West and the United States? Well, I think uh, yes. Uh, that's that's what keeps them together. Uh, is uh, the view of uh, well, in, in one phrase, American hegemony. Uh, which is a word, a phrase that's uh, coming, becoming once again part of uh, China's uh, lexicon. Um, especially, uh, interestingly enough, since that balloon episode, we could we might want to talk about the importance of that. Uh, so that is that is a common worldview that does keep China and and Russia together. Uh, the real question, though, is just how how deep does this partnership go? Uh, and there, of course, there is a uh, a point of view that uh, that it goes very deeply, and uh, and and on behalf of that view, it's pointed out that China and Russia have had ongoing military joint exercises. Okay, but I think what's uh, often forgotten is that uh, the the there is that uh, uh, negative history of China Russia relations, which uh, goes back uh, to the to the nineteenth and even earlier uh, centuries. Uh, it, it continues on through the efforts by the Russians to interfere in China's revolution um, under under Mao. Uh, and there have been any number of other episodes in which uh, there, there, one can say that there's a great deal of lingering suspicion on the part of China uh, about Russia. And, and the reverse, I think, is also true. So um, I don't think that uh, in a pinch, and now, and that pinch is the Ukraine war. The Chinese are not about to uh, to show to to make that partnership really as strategic as they call it. Uh, the Chinese are, are being very careful, as we've already discussed, about what they supply to Russia. Uh, they're certainly taking advantage of uh, of Russia's cheap oil. Uh, they do have a, an, an increasing amount of trade. It's now about $200 billion uh, total. Uh, but really, uh, the Chinese are being very, very careful. They're not about to make significant sacrifices in terms of their own security on behalf of the Russians. Uh, and I think if, if someday, if we ever get into the Chinese archives, I think we'll find that uh, Xi Jinping was really quite upset uh, that Russia was going to launch a war uh, against Ukraine. Does China not want tensions with the United States, not want to fight with the United States? Oh, I think uh, there are inevitable frictions, uh, and those will continue between China and the United States. Uh, you know, we have uh, issues over human rights, over trade. Uh, you know, it's a quite long, long list, and and those kinds of issues are not going to be resolved anytime soon. But on the other hand, uh, the Chinese have made very clear that they that there is a common agenda that we all ought to be pursuing. Uh, and that agenda certainly begins with uh, climate change and pandemics, where we've had very in the past, very good cooperation uh, with China on, for example, on SARS and the Ebola virus and so on, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and and so forth. It's really you know Xi Jinping has has mentioned about uh, a dozen different topics where he thinks that uh, the U.S. and China can make progress uh, for out of out of a 
common and find common ground. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't think the folks in Washington and the Biden administration uh, are really interested in in that. You know, what we say always is that, well, uh, where we can find some way to cooperate, we will. But at this, but the primary thing these days, and it's and it's very clearly stated in, for example, uh, the Biden Harris National Security Strategy paper of 2022, is that China is a a uh, an, a threat across the board, uh, not just military, but economic, technological, political, you know, you name it, and that perception is inhibiting any kind of real, uh, real serious work. On, on this common uh, agenda. And, uh, and now uh, it's, it's very clear that, uh, that uh, any, any prospect of a cooperative uh, relationship uh, is, is just very rapidly deteriorating. Uh, and, uh, and I think that balloon episode, which should not have been all that important, uh, has really marked a, a, an important divide uh, because I noticed that Chinese official statements now are no longer um, focusing on on the opportunities for uh, for cooperation. Uh, they're going back in language, and language is important uh, to Cold War issues. Uh, you know, U.S. hegemony, the United States is. Uh, I, I I can um, I can read you just one very recently. You know that last month the Chinese put out. Uh, a, a kind of a white paper called uh, called U.S. Hegemony and Its Perils. And <clears throat> I'll just read a, a few a few lines from it to give you a flavor for it. Uh, the United States has been overriding truth with its power and trampling justice to serve self-interest. These unilateral, egoistic and regressive hegemonic practices have drawn growing intense criticism and opposition from the international community. The United States must conduct serious soul searching. It must critically examine what it has done, let go of its arrogance and prejudice and quit its hegemonic domineering and bullying practices. Now that's that kind of language before uh, was, was rarely seen before that balloon episode, interestingly. Um, and but as you as you heard in just those few sentences, that word hegemony appears like three times, and it's a very and, and the word bullying, which we were just discussing, and it's just an uh, an important indicator of how uh, of how the the conversation with China has further deteriorated, um, and it's a it's a far cry from let's say the Biden Xi summit meeting that was held in Bali in mid uh, November when at least <clears throat> excuse me there was some prospect uh, that we were going to be <clears throat> turning things around and moving in a more positive direction and then came the the balloon episode and suddenly um, the Secretary of State's visit was canceled and there were a number of other visits that were going to take place at a high level with the Chinese <clears throat> and that is now gone. I am interested again in in the Cold War and this <clears throat> dynamic between Russia, China, and the United States. And and maybe it's instructive to what's happening today. But I'll let you explain that, whether if it is or not. But it, it, we think of the Soviet Union then and China as being natural allies, as as both communist states, at least run by communists. However, they had their own tensions going on through that whole period of time, and it was at, and it was eventually toward, towards the end of his life, Mao Zedong came to the conclusion that he couldn't trust Russia or, or the Soviet Union anymore, and it was under his orders or his direction or influence, again, I'll let you explain, uh, that it would be better to be allied with the United States. Well, I think uh, it's, you know, I just mentioned that uh, right now the United States faces uh, dual adversaries. Uh, Mao faced that very same issue uh, in the late 1960s, after, and in particular with uh, a border war uh, that went on with uh, the so then Soviet Union. And so, just as you said, he made the decision, a strategic decision, that the Soviet threat, which he called for the first time, Soviet social imperialism, quite a quite a 
a turn of phrase. You don't hear that very often. (laughs) No, uh, the notion, I mean, he, he now used he now used that expression to to say for the first time that a socialist state could be an imperialist power. And so he used that phrase social imperialism to say that that the Soviet Union was a greater threat than American imperialism. And thus the invitation to Richard Nixon uh, to visit Beijing. So he did, uh, he made the call and uh, in China's best interests, and, you know, I, I've, I've always thought that there's a lesson there for President Biden uh, that, you know, you don't want to have uh, two great powers be your enemy at the same time. And maybe you want to say that, uh, you know, we need to, uh, to take a, another look at, uh, at how to find common ground with China because the greater, the greater threat, as is demonstrated, you know, day after day in Ukraine is, is Russia. Before we wrap up, I do want to ask you about media in, in, here in the United States and its coverage mm. concerning China. On on yes. Sunday night, I, I watched 60 Minutes, you know, the, the night before the meeting between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, and, and it spent an hour. I don't know if it was a repeat or not, but it spent an hour uh, about China and about U.S. naval capa- uh, capabilities uh, in, in the Pacific Rim region. Um, and even in that program, it suggested that China that that the United States anticipated China would invade Taiwan by 2027 or so so something like the next four or five years talk to me about a do do you from what you were saying earlier that doesn't sound like what what you think um not at all yeah not at all and and I think I think such uh, predictions are baseless uh there's nothing to them other than uh the the notion that uh, well China is um is increasing in its in its uh, air and naval capability, uh, and is upset with uh, the U.S. buildup on Taiwan, and so therefore uh, they're going to attack. Uh, well, uh, there have been many such predictions lately, and the press has been, I think, quite irresponsible in um, in uh, echoing those predictions uh, when there's no sign, really, there's no sign at all that the Chinese are building up in preparation for uh, attacking across the Taiwan Strait. Uh, And that uh, particular naval officer, um, I think is the same one who also recently said that uh, the American people are being blind to China and so forth. Uh, Well, first of all, let's let's keep in mind that as a naval officer, he wants more money to build up further the Pacific uh, Rim capability. And, uh, and so uh, these guys are after uh, tr- trying to increase naval forces, just as the Air Force is trying to increase its, naval, its, its air capability. Well, uh, all of this is contributing to the Chinese perception that American hegemony uh, is, is uh, advancing in Asia and is out to contain China. I mean, if you look at the world and especially East Asia from a Chinese point of view, which I always like to do, you know, we should always try to see things from the other other sides uh, view. Uh, what's happening is that, uh, as I mentioned, Japan is becoming a more active player in, in U.S. Uh, strategy. Uh, the U.S. is actually building up its capabilities uh, in the Philippines, in Japan, and on Taiwan. And Taiwan, of course, is the most sensitive area uh, for for China. Uh, the U.S. is uh, is um, uh, rehabbing its uh, its so-called quadrilateral security dialogue with India, uh, Japan, and Australia. Uh, The U.S. is now going to be providing nuclear submarines for Australia. And the list goes on Uh, all over, just as was happening during the Cold War. uh, China is facing um, quite an array of military capabilities around its rim. Well, if you're uh, if you're looking at the world from Beijing, you know what are you going to conclude except that uh, that the U.S. Uh, is is preparing uh, to to restrain China's development uh, and is looking for a fight, and then makes predictions that about Taiwan, which could be an excuse 
uh, for having that fight. It's it's just a very dangerous game uh, that we're playing, feeding into the war machine, so to speak. And uh, and as you were suggesting a moment ago, the the media, uh, whether it's 60 Minutes or the Washington Post or the New York Times, uh, they are all echoing, as they often do, <laughs> Uh, echoing the the official line, and there are very few voices out there, even liberal ones, uh, which are trying to say, "Wait a minute, um, you know, where this this is uh, not a direction that we want to continue pushing without evidence." I do have a couple of friends who are regular listeners to this program in Taiwan. I suspect I'll be hearing from them after this conversation, and I welcome hearing from them. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, they very much do not see themselves as Chinese at all. They, they are Taiwanese, and it's very important to them, and they're very concerned about China taking over, over the island and undoing their, their, their way of life, basically, and their way of government and what they have created. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I know that uh, there is uh, that concern, um, although I think we should also keep in mind that um, – I don't know that that the that Taiwan's leaders are quite as dramatically upset as our own leaders are uh, over the, chi the the China threat. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, on a very positive note, just the other day, an announcement was made that that Taiwan's previous uh, president Ma, uh, Ma Yingjiu uh, is actually going going to uh, Beijing to have a meeting with Xi Jinping. Uh, and that's a very good sign uh, that uh, that, you know, that they can have that kind of dialogue uh, amidst all this war talk. So um, uh, as as sometimes happens, you know, it's it's the people who are most dramatic, most directly affected who are taking the lead uh, and trying to prevent a war that that, you know, could could rain down upon them. So that's that's a positive thing. Mel Gertoff has been our guest. Again, Mel Gertoff is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at Portland <laughs> State University. He is also the senior editor of the quarterly journal Asian Perspective, and he has joined us to talk about his book. It's called Engaging China. Mel Gertoff, that was helpful. I thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here.